present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us this week at the Regent Theatre in Ipswich, the fine county town of Suffolk. <laughs> Thanks to sea trade with Europe, Ipswich flourished during the Middle Ages, having close ties with Antwerp, later twinned with Dectwerp. Ipswich is a major centre for the manufacture of agricultural machinery. Here is produced equipment essential to farmers' needs, such as the revolving reel combine harvester, which separates grain from straw to ensure an efficient harvest, and the gear-driven half-spinner, which turns intruders around to ensure they're not inadvertently shot in the back. <laughs> Just along the coast is the village of... Just along the coast is the village of Orford, famous for its ancient smokehouses. Recent experiments with different types of wood produced a variety of smokes, with the result that the nuns at nearby Orford Convent celebrated seven new popes in one afternoon. <laughs> Ipswich houses the court where Mrs. Wallace Simpson obtained her divorce prior to marrying the Duke of Windsor. However, Wallace kept her married surname, preferring not to go back to her maiden name of Anne Gromit. <laughs> However, not all names from the past are so easily confused with amusing comic characters. <laughs> Let's meet the teens. They are on my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Jeremy Hardy. And preparing to score on the desk next to me, please welcome the ever delightful Samantha. Okay, we start with an educational round about the English language. There's often confusion regarding the exact definition of apparently similar terms. For example, the words habitable and livable are not interchangeable. Habitable describes a property which, although not necessarily fully equipped, is technically capable of being occupied, whereas livable is where the scousers come from. <laughs> However, words are constantly changing their meanings, and I'd like the teams to share with us any new definitions they may have spotted recently. By the way, teams, I don't want to hear any shameless plugging of your recently published Uxbridge English Dictionary, even though it is a fine read for all fans of new definitions, <laughs> and currently flying off the shelves at the bargain price of $7.99. <laughs> Barry, would you care to start, please? Ivy. Roman for four. Graham uh, Cloister A pretentious clam <laughs> Tim Labour Tory <laughs> Jeremy Hamas What Geordies use to bang nails in <laughs> Megawatt. Pardon? <laughs> Liability. Political skill. <laughs> <laughs> Cashew. Nut that makes you sneeze. <laughs> Pistachio. <laughs> I won't bother finishing that. <laughs> Marmalade, the cry of a newborn chick. <laughs> Receptacle, a playful welcome from the lady at the front desk. <laughs> Dukedom, 
aristocratic birth control aid. <laughs> Pancreas, a gland located next to King's Cross. <laughs> Concurrent, an object that looks like a raisin, but isn't. <laughs> File of fax, pastry so thin you can send it by telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Comatose, what a beautician does to a lady with a lot of unwanted hair. <laughs> Propaganda, a good look. Tinker, an Irish philosopher. <laughs> Dubai, oh. Debbie from Birmingham. <laughs> Florida, more red in the face. <laughs> Platypus, give your cat pigtails. <laughs> Tally ho, a loose woman who keeps count. Worth waiting for. The teams are going to sing for us now. Yeah. And that's in the round called One Song to the Tune of Another, where the teams are given the words of one song to be sung to the tune of another. Piano accompaniment for the songs will be provided by Colin Sell. In fact, Colin puts in so much practice he must know these tunes backwards. <laughs> Certainly sounds like it. <laughs> Barry, we'll start with you. Would you please sing the words of You've Lost That Loving Feeling by the Righteous Brothers to the tune of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You never close your eyes Anymore when I kiss Your lips and there's no tenderness Like before in your fingertips You're trying hard not to show it Baby, but baby, baby, I know it, you've lost that loving feeling. Ooh, that loving feeling. You've lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Woo! Now there's no welcome look in your eyes when I reach for you. And now you're starting to. Criticize little things I do It makes you just feel like crying, baby You now, Jeremy <laughs> Would you please sing the words of Move Closer by Phyllis Nelson To the tune of Cum Ronda. When we're together, touching each other And our bodies do what we feel When we're dancing, smooching and swaying Tender love songs softly playing Move closer, move closer Move your body real close, real close Until we feel like we're really making Love. Okay, your turn, Tim. Would you please sing the words of Who Let the Dogs Out to the tune of the Toreador's March? <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Woof, 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 woof. Who let the dogs out? Woof, 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 woof. Who let the dogs out? Woof, 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 woof. Who let the dogs out? Well, the party was on the ice. The party was pumping. I e p i i o. And finally, Graham, would you please sing the words of Captain Beaky to the tune of Charles Aznavour's lovely song, She. <laughs> the bravest animals in the land are Captain Beaky and his band. 
That's Timmy too, the reckless rat, that fool Owland, but he boy. March through the woodlands, singing songs, that's how they write it wrong. Once he sees his seed, an evil snake kept the woodland for our way. In fear and trembling every night, in case he gave someone a bite, said that the owl will lie in wait, and one of us will be the bait. Said Captain Beaky, have no fear, for I alone will volunteer. No, make it me, say the reckless rat. I have to stand there in my reckless life. We have a new round now called Spelling Bee. Spelling contests have long been popular in the United States, and thanks to recent films and TV shows, they're now catching on over here. There's even a new TV series hosted by Eamon Holmes, who I have to say has really grown into the job. <laughs> anyway, we're going to enjoy our own spelling bee now. The name is self-explanatory, so off we go. Barry, I'd like you to spell... B. Ooh, um... B, E, E. Graham, would you please spell <laughs> B? B E E. Tim, <laughs> I'd like you please. I'd like you please to spell the word <laughs> B. B E E. <laughs> and finally, Jeremy. Would you spell B, too? Um, could I have a sentence with the word B in it? <laughs> Look, a B. <laughs> B, E, E? Well, we've all had a lot of fun spelling B. I hope you enjoyed it at home. <laughs> If this catches on, we may well expand the game to include other words. <laughs> Let's move swiftly on. House buying is all the range on television these days, and never once to miss a trend. The teams are now going to bring it to radio. In the round, the teams will take it in turns to be estate agents, like Phil and Kirsty off the telly. The estate agent's job is to take a couple of prospective buyers around a property and convince them that it meets all their requirements. Right, Barry and Graham, you can start this one. I'd like you to assume the role of the estate agents while Tim and Jeremy are the buyers. Off you go. Well, here we are. I think this is probably what you're looking for. What were you looking for, exactly? Well, well sort of... Um, rural Edel, rural, really. Yeah, miles, miles, miles away. Miles away, miles away. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Sort of yeah. Co cottages, sort of? Cottage, 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 cottage yeah. Rural cottage, yes. Well, this you'd probably like, this uh, <coughs> penthouse cottage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, where, where is that? In Hackney, in East in Hackney. Hackney. Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's <laughs> Very quite a very rural part of Hackney. Marshes. Right. Think well, marshes. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, there doesn't seem to be any glass in any of, any of the windows at all. Well, no, this is another good thing. It's only a stone's throw from the nearest school. Are there uh, any toilets? In... Um, the toilets, uh, I think... On all floors. Right? On all floors. <laughs> Strictly speaking, it's a lift, but it um, <laughs> does visit all floors eventually. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Would there be room for a potential for a roof terrace? Yeah, but there's potential for a roof. You <laughs> uh, can start from the ground up with this property. Yeah. Right, so is there any problem with rising damp at all? Uh, no, you're lucky there. It's, it's falling damp. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's nearly reached the ground. <laughs> Well, we're actually what? quite keen on rural, yeah, rural country sports. Yeah, country sports. Yes, know. yes. Mm. Well, 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 of what? Oh, well, shooting. Sh sh oh, yes, plenty. Plenty of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all the time. Dogs. Dogs, Dogs yes. Dogs. yes. We're, we're, we're animal lovers, aren't we? Uh, well, yeah. they're very broad-minded in this part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is, is that the original moulding? Uh, uh, which? The... Uh, the blue hairy the stuff. <laughs> no, no, the green is the original. Uh, yes. 
blue hair and stuff. Just you can bit. grow your own as well. Yes. <laughs> is, there a, is there a local family butcher? Uh, that's, uh, funnily enough, how the flat came to be vacant. <laughs> I'm entirely sure it is what we're looking for. No, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Nice to be a Okay, your turn to be the estate agents this time, Tim and Jeremy, and you, Barry and Graham, will be the potential buyers. Good morning. Good morning. Not Good exactly morning. where you're looking for. Well, it's sort of pied a terre, really. Yes, something pretty course. central. Some are fairly small, but uh, central in, in town. Yes, right yeah. in town. Right in the middle of Southwold, is it? Um, <laughs> well, we were, we, were, we were thinking more slightly closer to London than Southwold, but. Well, uh, there's sort of a London Marina area. Oh, really? Yes. Sort of coastal London. Coastal uh, London. Yeah. <laughs> well, we think. Yes. We think we think you we think you yeah. you like it very much. Is it's it? very very good for trains. Yeah, Not very good for stations, uh, but no. a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of trains. Sometimes they'll come right off the track and straight to your door. <laughs> we were looking for something lofty, you know, sort of wharf loft conversion, yes. that sort of thing. Well, it is it is yes. converted. Yeah. Catholics aren't allowed in this part of Suffolk anymore. <laughs> There are original features in Suffolk because most people marry close relatives. Um. <laughs> it's a little more countryfied than we had in mind. Yeah, well, yeah, I because... think you'll enjoy it. There's the lovely big wicker man that's being built just down the road. <laughs> yeah. you see, well, I don't know about this countryside thing because we're both wheat intolerant. Well, there, everyone's intolerant around here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> almost, uh, almost nothing is, in, is tolerated. I, I think we'll think about it, won't we? We, we will. We'll go Not for long, but think we'll think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Radio 4 is constantly striving to improve its services to listeners. For example, during the recent election campaign, World at One was allocated an extra half hour to provide extended coverage of their technical difficulties. <laughs> So, before the show, we asked our studio audience what single change might best improve Radio 4. And the result is now available. 3% pressed A, a live audience version of quote-unquote. 4% pressed button B and got their money back. 2% thought the answer was C, delete as applicable while the remaining 91% press button D, more trails. <laughs> so teams, I'd like you to assume the role of Radio 4 continuity announcers. Your job is to take it in turns to introduce new programs whose makers have spent more time on the title than they have on the content. And will you start these, Graham? Handy hints are in the offing here on Radio 4. If you're one of those people who find you are unable to clean your carpets, then you can learn how to sew them all together to make one enormous carpet. That's coming next in If You Can't Beat Them, Join Them. Tim. Oh. <laughs> Later today on Radio 4, a satirical look at public hangings in the noose quiz. <laughs> After news at 1.30, we look back to 1964 when a gale swept through London Zoo and blew the doors off the insect house. That's after the news, your flies are open. <laughs> this afternoon's play is based on the diary of a knit nurse. That's lice work if you can get it. <laughs> Later on Radio 4, an amusing look at author Joanna Trollope's motor insurance claims history in Crash Bang Trollope. <laughs> Nine o'clock, Radio 4's archive hour, interviews some of the bomber crews from the Second World War who used to dedicate their bombs to members of their families. The archive hour, drop them for your uncle. <laughs> Tomorrow we have a report on how female shift workers are being denied time to breastfeed their babies. That's never give a suckler an evening break. <laughs> uh, 
Next on Radio 4, a new dating game for necrophiliacs. Dale Winton introduces Drop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> Okay. I keep saying okay all the time. It gives an entirely false impression. In our next round, the teams will take us back to the golden age of correspondence, as in this modern electronic age, proper letter writing has all but died out. With email and the like, we've lost the joy of opening a crisp envelope with a letter knife and the expectant delight of sliding out the two halves of a postal order. So in an effort to reverse the decline in letter writing, I'd like you teams to construct a series of correspondence between certain famous people from the past. Barry and Graham will start by composing a letter from Sir Walter Raleigh to Elizabeth I, and then Tim and Jeremy will come up with the reply, and so on, and so on, and so on. (laughs) However, the challenge is that the letters must be constructed by each panelist, alternating one word at a time. When I honk my horn... It's the end of the correspondence. Off you go, Barry and Graham. Dear... Who's who? (laughs) Well, Raleigh. Oh, dear... Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Two dears, no idea. Dear Liz. Dear. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right, it's very affectionate. We've started. Dear, dear, dear. (laughs) How How are you... I... I am very happy here in America where the natives have granted me the potato (laughs) for (laughs) the occasion of your birthday, which I understand (laughs) is next Tuesday. (laughs) So, here, Liz is my potato (laughs) if Tuesday is indeed (laughs) convenient. (laughs) P.S. I have also enclosed a packet (laughs) of Twenty filter tips, <laughs> which I hope you will enjoy with a loving kiss. Wall. Dear Rawley, you <laughs> say. Potato, but I say potato. Potato, potato, potato. potato. Let's throw the whole thing off. (laughs) We enjoy very much the chips which we ate last Friday. My husband. (laughs) Hello. Hello. Doesn't marry me, <coughs> but sleeps with the under pants <laughs> on his head. <laughs> Shakespeare said he'd come to the birthday of my old sister, <laughs> who is in Scotland. <laughs> She has a very nice piece of (laughs) tasty trouser. (laughs) We enjoy (laughs) having this milk round for a game of Twister. (laughs) With naked (laughs) laugh 
Oh, your monarch, Liz. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, I notice it's very nearly the end of the show, but there's just time to squeeze in a round of menswear department songbook. Samantha has to nip off now as she's on a training program for her new job in Burton's. This evening it's footwear, and the manager has promised to explain shoe sizes and slipper lengths in the sock room. So while she's away enjoying that, teams, I'd like you please to suggest song titles guaranteed to delight an audience drawn from the menswear trade. Graham, will you start, please? Can't buy me glove. <laughs> Barry. Zippy a doodah. <laughs> Jim, I like driving in my car, Diggum. Jeremy. He wore a teeny weeny itsy bitsy yellow polka dot tie. <laughs> yes, sir, that's my Burberry. <laughs> In a discreet cubicle at the back, somebody is trying on super camouflage elastic exami issue blouses. <laughs> Put your sweatshirt a little closer to the phone. <laughs> glove is all around. <laughs> Let there be glove. <laughs> glove me tender. <laughs> Silly glove songs. <clears throat> the theme from Glove Story. <laughs> How deep is your glove? Once I had a secret glove. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as the housewife of time adjusts her lipstick in the mirror of destiny, and the cyclist of fate disappears under her speeding four by four. It's time to end the show. So from myself, Samantha, the teams, and the fine folk of Ipswich, it's goodbye. Barry Cryer, Graham Garden, Jeremy Hardy, and Tim Brooke Taylor will be given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Colin Sell setting some of them to music. The programme consultant was Ian Pattinson, and the producer was John Naismith. Present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us this week on a return visit to Ipswich, the undisputed jewel in Suffolk's crown. A beautiful county of gently rolling hills, Suffolk is bordered by Norfolk with its historic Tudor villages and nature reserve coastline, by Cambridgeshire with its fine university and unspoiled countryside, and by Essex. <laughs> Opening in the 1920s, Ipswich Airport operated Britain's first air services to Paris. It was one of these flights that brought the great French dessert chef Escoffier to Ipswich, where he set about traditional English tarts and was soon famous for his spotty dick. <laughs> Early charity parachute jumps also took place at Ipswich Airport, including the first made by a blind man. Older staff at the aerodrome remember it as a unique occasion, as they'd never before heard a golden Labrador scream. <laughs> To the north of Suffolk is Newmarket, home of the Jockey Club. Founded in 1752, it's responsible for the control and regulation of underpants. 
In recent years, the coastline around Ipswich has suffered severe erosion, but this has proved a boon to hunters of fossils that are released by the waves and deposited by the incoming tide. <laughs> so there's no shortage of washed-up relics here. <laughs> they are on my left, Graham Gardner, by the time. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Jeremy Hardy. And please welcome the lady who gets her head down when the team's points are up. <laughs> our scorer, the delightful Samantha. OK, let's get on with it. We started with a game that I see is called Kiss of Death. Nice to see some much-needed accuracy creeping in at last. <laughs> in this round, I'll ask the teams to suggest examples of remarks which, if uttered on a first date, would guarantee an immediate termination of the relationship. Graham, would you care to start, please? I hope you don't mind men who like to play rough. I've got one waiting in the bedroom. <laughs> Tim? No wonder you didn't send a photo. <laughs> Shall we listen to quote-unquote? <laughs> Barry? You don't sweat much for a big girl. <laughs> Jeremy? There's something different about you. You're so alive. <laughs> Let's do it right here and now while everyone's concentrating on the sermon. Oh dear, sorry about this. I hope it's just nits. <laughs> I would ask you back to my place, but I've got a chainsaw in soak. <laughs> <coughs> well, that's better out than in. <laughs> Look out! Just my little joke. <laughs> I find myself torn between Veritas and UKIP. Get your balaclava on, you pull. <laughs> OK, the teams are going to sing along now with some well-known discs in the game called Pick Up Song. Samantha made her customary visit to the gramophone library earlier where she found a producer was filming a documentary. He was pleased to see Samantha as he needed a body double and explained that although he wasn't sure he could use her arms or hands, he'd certainly be happy to find her legs apart. So <laughs> Samantha is now poised over the record deck with this week's selection of discs and ready to give them a spin. You should sing along, teams, until at my signal, Samantha turns the volume down. If on the music's return you're within a gnat's crotchet of the original, I'll be awarding points. And points mean prizes. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> <laughs> This week's prize will ideally suit every proud homeowner who wants to keep their carpets pine-fresh and viper-free. It's a year's supply of snake and vac. <laughs> Barry, you can start. I'd like you to accompany Tony Christie singing Is This the Way to Amarillo? When the day is dawning On a Texas Sunday morning How I long to be there with Marie, who's waiting for me there Every lonely city Where I hang my hat Ain't as half as pretty As where my baby's at Is this a way to Amarillo? Every night I've been hugging my pillow Taking dreams of Amarillo You now, Graham, would you please accompany Peter Sosset singing Where Do You Go To, My Lovely? You talk like my 
apartment off the boulevard Saint Michel where you keep your Rolling Stone records and a friend of Sasha Distel yes do no, <laughs> but where do you go to my lovely when you're alone in your bed <laughs> tell me the thousands around you I want to look inside your head. Tim, would you please accompany Althea and Donna singing Uptown Top Rank? <laughs> Silly in the heels acting, then check say we're hip panting. True, them to no anting. We have no going anting. No pop, no style. Our strictly roots. No pop, no style. Our strictly roots. See me upon the road, I hear you call out to me. True, you see me in a pants and ting. See me in a altar back. See me give you a heart attack. Give me little bass, make me one up my waist. Up town top ranking, oh! Up town top ranking, oh! Up town top ranking. See me in my pension tink, oh! Driving no constant spring. Them checkers say me come on Cosmo Spring, but a true. Can't you constant spring? <laughs> And finally, Jeremy. <laughs> Would you please accompany Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel singing Come Up and See Me, Make Me Smile? <clears throat> You've, You've done, done it all. all. You've, You've broken, broken every code. And pulled the rebel to the floor. <laughs> you spoiled the game. No matter what you say, for only metal, what the ball? <laughs> blue eyes, blue eyes, how come you tell so many lies? I come up and see me, make me smile. Or do what you want, running wild. <laughs> There's nothing left. Old gun and run away. <laughs> Maybe you'll tarry for a while. It's just a test, a game for us to play. We know lose, it's hard to smile. Right. The teams will take turns to act out scenes illustrating well-known proverbs for their opponents to guess. Proverbs are, of course, those wise sayings expressing pithy advice to anyone with an interest in pith. <laughs> Tim and Jeremy, you're to start, please, and your proverb will shortly be displayed to the audience via the laser display screen. <laughs> for listeners at home, here's the mystery voice. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Right, you're guessing this one, Barry and Graham. Off you go, Tim and Jeremy. There are eight words and it goes Ooh. like this. Oh. How are we going to get rid of him? <laughs> we... <laughs> we must use a computer. Is it a special, beautifully looking little computer? <laughs> it is very stylish and favoured by graphic designers. Can you use all PC programs on it? No, it is not compatible with much PC software. <laughs> I, I think I can guarantee he won't be back for 24 hours. Exterminate. <laughs> Exterminate the end. <laughs> Good 
This is obviously keeping somebody at bay, isn't it, for 24 mm, yeah. hours, I would have said. Because you are the next Doctor Who, aren't you, Baz? Yes, indeed. <laughs> so it's the Doctor and uh, a Macintosh. <laughs> so close. <laughs> An apple. Yeah! And apple a day. Yeah, absolutely. Right, your turn, Barry and Graham. Your proverb is now being exhibited on the laser display board, and here again is the mystery voice for listeners at home. Love me, love my dog. Love me, love my dog. That's right, five words, I think. Five, yep. Yeah. Here it is. <laughs> oh, Mr. Blunkett. <laughs> A three in a bed romp. <laughs> the end. Um, you can lead the Home Secretary to water. water. <laughs> love, you, love something, love the dog. I'll I'll give you know love me, love my dog. Yeah. Ah, love me, love my dog. Yeah. Love me, love my dog. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's now time to play the game called Mornington Crescent. First, first, I noticed from the more than 20,000 envelopes we received this week that we've been entered into the Reader's Digest prize draw. <laughs> and that there's a postcard from a Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. She writes, Dear Mr. Mandela, <laughs> that big statue in Trafalgar Square looks nothing like you. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Mrs. Trellis. And on with the game teams, and in a bid to speed things up, I have this week provided you each with the latest satellite navigation technology. So if you'd please program into your sat-nav boxes a route from Liverpool Street to Mornington Crescent, which takes account of Montague's second stationary ruling, I'd like you to start, please, Tim. Right, f from Liverpool Street, yes. That's okay. what I said, five minutes. <laughs> Let me just uh, set it up. Turn right after 200 yards. <laughs> Well, that's quite helpful. I think that takes me into Gooch Street. Yeah. Go Gooch. 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 Oh, now let me see. You've got the map upside down. No. <laughs> oh, great! So clever. Shut up and let me concentrate. <laughs> Okay, Farringdon. 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 Um. Continue straight when you get to the junction. Okay, that's 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 Hyde Park Corner. Um, right. We'll go to Oxford Street. Please execute a U-turn immediately. This is a one-way street. Oh. <laughs> um, Oxford Circus is what I meant. Oxford. Oxford Circus. Very funny. <laughs> okay, let's see this bit. Carry on after the box junction. No, wait. Yes, straight ahead. Sorry, I lost my bearings there for a minute. <laughs> well, pull yourself together. I've got a headache. <laughs> So, uh, Fairlop. Oh, Fairlop, yeah. Fairlop. Mm. Yeah, I'll leave me alone, I'll sort this out. Whoops. That's a northern approach, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> now then. Uh, fritz, uh, fritz, uh... Have you never played this game before? <laughs> Shut up, you. Um... Bethnal Green. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, uh, Turnpike okay. Lane. That was fantastic play, Jeremy. Thank you very <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I love you, Jeremy. <laughs> um, Bad news. I've got a headache. <laughs> 
I think we need to head for uh, Camden Turn Town. Left. Oh, no right. left. Left. Other left. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll have Cam- Camden Town. Oh, oh dear. Um, I'll go there. Stop. Oh, all right. No. Um, <laughs> Oxford Circus. Um. Um. Oh. Hackney Central. Oh dear. Clumsy play. Okay, let's see what she's got. I to don't do. believe it. Did you see that? World of Leather have got a sale on. Um, oh, Fulham Broadway. I love you, Jeremy. <laughs> Not now. Please sing to me. Please. No. No. <laughs> Did it the old man say Montague second stationary ruling? Yes. What's uh, what's wrong with that? That's a northern approach, is it not? Uh, oh, I see. Yes. Um, oh, uh, well. Uh, no conferring. Oh. <laughs> Bell sized park. Ah, in that case, um, oh dear, um, Lower Regent Street? Moorgate. Oh. You now have to sacrifice seven sisters. <laughs> I've got excited again. Beware. That is a vertical approach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Waterloo. That was fantastic play, Jeremy. <laughs> Where? That's it. Mornington Crescent. <laughs> Our next round is dedicated to the US President. <laughs> George W. Bush is the elected leader of the world's only superpower, controller of the world's most influential economic infrastructure, and supreme commander of the largest nuclear weapons equipped military force on the planet. You couldn't make it up, could you? (laughs) But then, according to a Gallup poll, 3.7 million of the American electorate believe they've been abducted and interrogated by aliens. Presumably with the question, what were you thinking? Teams, I brought along a selection of incomplete quotations from speeches made by President Bush, which I'd like you to finish off. Okay, Graham, we'll start with you. His first quotation was delivered in Saginaw, Michigan, while attempting to prove his environmental credentials. In the Pacific Northwest, I have made it clear to the citizens up there, I oppose breaching those dams. I know the human being and fish can... can legally marry in France. (laughs) Here's what he actually said. I oppose breaching those dams. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. Okay, your turn, Tim. This remark by George W. Bush was made in Washington on January the 11th, 2001. We'll make America where we want it to be. A literate country and a... And a country where people can read and write. <laughs> as well. Here's what he actually said. We'll make America where we want it to be. A literate country and a hopeful a country. I've got a headache. (laughs) Don't blame you. You now, Jeremy, here's a part of a quote by George W. from a campaign speech in Iowa. We cannot let terrorists and rogue nations hold this nation hostile or hold... (laughs) Or hold the baby after the bathwater is bolted. (laughs) That was fantastic play, Jeremy. (laughs) I love you, Jeremy. 
<laughs> Here's what he actually said. We cannot let terrorists and rogue nations hold this nation hostile or hold our allies hostile. I don't, un I don't understand why he declared war on tourists. <laughs> <laughs> And Barry, another remark made by the president at a press conference. See, without the tax relief package, there would have been a deficit, but there wouldn't have been the commiserate, uh, the, 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 not commiserate, the, the, the. <laughs> Nurse! Here's what he actually said. The, 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 not measure, the, the, the kick to our economy. It's not even his second language. <laughs> OK, here are some for any of you to have a go at. Here he is again with some remarks said at a press conference from the Rose Garden of the White House. You know, let me, let me talk about Al-Qaeda just for a second. I've, I made the statement that we're dismantling senior management, and we are. Uh, our, our people have done a really good job of hauling in a lot of the key operators. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, Mahmoud Indigo, <laughs> Sheikh Rattle and Roll, <laughs> Yes Sir, That's My Baby, and Salim Dion. <laughs> Here's what he actually said. Uh, our, our people have done a really good job of hauling in a lot of the key operators. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, Ramzi uh, Ramzi Al Sheeb, or whatever the guy's name was. And finally, here's George W. after meeting with a special envoy to Iraq in the Oval Office. The ambassador and the general were briefing me on the vast majority of Iraqis uh, want to live in a peaceful, free world. And uh, we, we will find these people. And and disillusion them. Here's what he actually said. A vast majority of Iraqis uh, want to live in a peaceful, free world. And uh, we, we will find these people, and we will bring them to justice. <laughs> it's very nearly at the end of the show, but it's, there's, just time to fit in, there's just time to fit in a round of Smokers Book Club. Samantha has to nip out now, as she likes to smoke fine cigars. Obviously, smokers are banished from inside buildings these days. So she's off out the back to enjoy a hand-rubbed Cuban in a doorway. <laughs> so while she's away doing that, I'd like the teams to suggest titles of books likely to suit a readership of smokers. You can start this one, Jeremy. Great Expectorations. <laughs> Tim? A Tale of Two Siggies. <laughs> Barry? On Her Majesty's Senior Service. <laughs> Graham? The Da Vinci Cough. <laughs> Silas Marlborough. <laughs> 20,000 Fags Under the Sea. <laughs> Angela's Ashtray. The spy who came in for a fag. <laughs> Tinker Taylor, soldier ashtray. <laughs> Catch down full strength's mandolin. The curious incident of the dog end in the night. <laughs> Eats cheroots and leaves. I, Claudius, oh. am having a fag. <laughs> 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 
Well, that's the end of the show. <laughs> Harry Pothead and the Philosopher's Bong. <laughs> by by oh. J.K. Rollups. <laughs> ah. Well, that's the end of the show. But first, I'll ask the teams to read the cuttings they brought along. <laughs> <laughs> All done? Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. OK. With that, it's goodbye from the teams, myself, Samantha, and the good folk of Ipswich. Goodbye. <laughs>Historians have recently proved that a small group led by one Owain Madog sailed from these shores from America. Their descendants were discovered in the 18th century as a tribe of apparently Native American Indians who were in fact obviously Welsh. As the English settlers crossed the Midwest Plains, they spotted smoke signals and realized the tribe were burning down their holiday homes. <laughs> This coastline is famous for its massive castles, and the first was built by Llewellyn the Great as a royal home, but this is now a sad ruin, thanks to Llewellyn the Bowen. <laughs> inland, inland, the area is noted for its outstanding natural beauty, and down the years it's attracted many famous visitors, including Princess Margaret, who went on her honeymoon to Mount Snowdon. <laughs> Along the coast, the town of Colwyn Bay boasts the world's largest annual fishing festival. Last year's was this big. <laughs> this part of Wales is very much linked with the legend of Owen Glendour, the 15th century nationalist leader, whom locals believe will reappear to fight unwelcome incursions by the English and seldom can his presence have been more urgently required <laughs> than when I say, let's meet the teams. <laughs> there are, on my left, Barry Cryer and Andy Hamilton. <laughs> and on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Tony Hawkes. And eager to please, on the desk next to me, a warm welcome for our delightful scorer, the lovely Samantha. OK, we start with an educational round, looking at the subtleties in meaning of certain words in the English language. For example, there's often confusion between terms such as strategy and tactics. Well, strategy represents the art or science of the planning and conduct required successfully to achieve long-term goals, whereas tactics are little minty sweets. <laughs> so, teams, I'd like you please to share any new definitions you may have spotted recently. Barry, would you care to start, please? Expert. Saggy. <laughs> Tim? Digression, Welsh fighting talk. <laughs> Andy. Chafe, a posh chav. <laughs> Tony. 
Euthanasia. Young people in China. <laughs> Gastronome, flatulent elf. <laughs> oh, on that theme, impending, death of a pixie. <laughs> Witchcraft, Anne Robinson's boat. <laughs> Rumination, Australia. Fallacy, cocky. <laughs> Nubile, recent speech by Ian Paisley. <laughs> nice. Wisteria, a nostalgic form of panic. Triumph, to attempt to get off with our chairman. <laughs> Lamentable. <laughs> the Sunday roast is ready. <laughs> A la carte, Muslim wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> Trans sister, a nun with surprisingly large hands. <laughs> the teams are going to sing for us okay. now in the game we call One Song to the Tune of Another. Probably the easiest way to understand this is to think of a song as supermarket shopping. The tune is represented by the trolley, holding together and transporting the goods or words. If you had a shorter song, then it might be just a handheld basket, in which case you may qualify for the speedy of nine items or fewer checker. <laughs> Not that that should make any difference. No one who works in a supermarket can add up anyway. <laughs> Present them with two dozen checkouts and they think they can be staffed by four people. Well, with that explained, piano accompaniment will be provided by Dennis King. <laughs> listeners, listeners will be interested to learn that Dennis studied at the Guildhall School of Music and went on to become Britain's most accomplished writer of TV music, including the themes from Black Beauty, Wurzel Gummidge and Lovejoy. With countless film and TV credits and appearances, his glittering career eventually presented Dennis the ultimate professional challenge. Standing in for Colin Sell. <laughs> okay, Tim, you can start this round by singing the words of Roxanne by the police to the tune of Dennis King's best known composition, the theme to Black Beauty. <laughs> Roxanne, you don't have to put on the red light Those days are over, you don't have to sell your body to the night <laughs> Roxanne, you don't have to wear that dress tonight Walk the streets for money, you don't care if it's right or if it's right Do you know this chick that is Roxanne? You don't have to put on the red light Roxanne, you don't have to put the red light We're going to final finish Put on the red light Put on the red light You now, Barry, I'd like you to sing the words of There's No One Quite Like Grandma to the tune of Delilah <laughs> There's no one quite like Grandma, and I know you will agree. She always is a friend to you, and she's a friend to me. There's no one quite like Grandma. There in times of need before it's bedtime on her knee. a book she'll read 
Grandma, we love you, Grandma, we do. Of you, and one day when we're older, we'll look back. You now, Tony, would you please sing the words of Girlfriend in a Coma by the Smiths <laughs> to the tune of Tiptoe Through the Tulips? So, girlfriend, in a coma, I know. I know it's really serious. There were times when I could have murdered her, but you know, I would hate anything to happen to her. Do you really think she'll pull through? Do you really think she'll pull through? Finally, Andy, would you please sing the words of Daddy Wouldn't Buy Me a Bow Wow to the tune of the Can Can? <laughs> I love my little cat, I do, its coat is oh so warm. It comes each day with me to school and sits up on the floor. The teacher says, why do you bring that little pet of yours? I tell her that I bring my cat along with me because Daddy wouldn't buy me a bow wow, bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. Daddy wouldn't buy me a bow wow 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 wow. I got a little cat and I'm very fond of that, but I'd rather have a bow wow bow wow bow wow wow. I can die happy now. <laughs> Actually, any time before the end of the show would be good. <laughs> Our next game is called Karaoke Koki and requires audience participation. One of the best loved national traits of the Welsh is their unfailing ability at community singing, even faced with the worst adversity. In the dark days of the Great War, one recalls how the Welsh guards in the trenches sang bread of heaven across no man's land to intimidate the enemy. <laughs> they could only respond with a few hundred thousand rounds of how it's a shell that... <laughs> every day for the next four years. <laughs> Our audience will shortly be invited to hum a song. The first team to buzz in and identify the song wins points. If they're wrong, the audience must pick up humming again where they left off <laughs> until someone gets it right or my tranquilizers wear off. <laughs> audience, the title of your first song will now be relayed to you via the laser display screen. For listeners at home, here's the mystery voice. Kalon Lan. Kalon Lan. OK, Dennis, will you play a brief introduction and then off you should go. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Start us off next. Is it the buzz? sound of silence? <laughs> Tony, you buzzed. I, I did buzz, but... Uh, oh, they oh, started again. They're singing, they're Where's singing. The no, it's not singing. That's, that's the wasp's nest. I've heard that. <laughs> don't, don't discourage them. They're singing. Barry. It's Beyonce, but I don't know which one. <laughs> I don't know what it is, Barry. but I think I'd like it to stop. <laughs> Can we hear a bit more? Pick, pick it up where you left off. Where <laughs> All together now. Is it in 
well. It's Welsh. Well, we wouldn't know it then. <laughs> it's Welsh, isn't it? It's a Welsh song. What is what, it? What is it? Not unusual. I don't know. It's Welsh. Do, you... <laughs> Do any of you know? No. No, well, nobody gets any marks then. <laughs> Are you going Audience, to tell us what I don't was? know how to pronounce it, so tell them what it is. <laughs> Calon Lang. Ah, ah. Very, very beautiful. Nice. Very beautiful. Nice. Which is now Nolak, spelled backwards. <laughs> I don't know how I can work that information into my life in any use. <laughs> Let's try another one. Here's a further song title for you, audience, and here's the mystery voice for listeners at home. The Hallelujah Chorus. The Hallelujah Chorus. Are you all ready, teams? Okay, Dennis, another intro, please. Some of the audience are patronising us by singing the name of the song. <laughs> Which is... It was Ali and Lula. Lula. <laughs> yes, it was the Hallelujah Chorus. Ah, yeah. In eight different keys. <laughs> OK, that went well. Off we go on to another game. Oh. Hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll say that again. That went well off. <laughs> we go on to another game. The game is called Ready Steady Health Kitchen. <laughs> now, see, I'm required to assume the role of Angus Deaton. So while two prostitutes and a kilo of cocaine <laughs> are delivered to my dressing room, I'll explain how it works. This is a game of competitive cookery. Cookery shows are all the rage these days, with hosts such as Ainsley Harriet, who I notice seems to have changed a bit since the days when he was in All Creatures Great and Small. <laughs> in this time, each team will be given a selection of cooking equipment, and their task is to create a mouth-watering dish within a given time limit. You can start, Tim and Tony, and I'd like you to pretend to be two celebrities, one a chef. <laughs> I've provided you with the following equipment, a knife, an egg whisk, a saucepan, an electric tin opener, and a gas oven. So you, Tony, are the chef, Raymond Blanc, and you, Tim, are the queen. <laughs> Off, you go. Off mm. you go. First, we start with the ingredients. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> what are you going to put in there, Raymond? Well, we start with a fox. Right. And I have one of my corgis. Excellent. Yes. Also a swan. And a horse. And a horse. Yes. Okay. okay. But first we need to use kitchen uh, utensils. Oh, uh, where is your egg timer? Ah, uh, he's got the day off. <laughs> the clock's ticking away. Well, let's put the oven on. Okay, a... start the clock. Yes. What, what, uh, <laughs> what, what are you going to turn it up to? <laughs> um, have you got a knob of butter? Uh, no, I'm just... <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just not particularly pleased to see it. <laughs> Turn it up. Put it on gas Mark Phillips or something. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Excellent. What did you just do? <laughs> I'm the Queen. I can do whatever yeah, I like. Not, all. <laughs> not in my country, you can't. <laughs> We have ways of dealing with your types. Okay, hurry let's up. get on with the cooking. We have done nothing. Hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Quick, press this. What is that? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I'm losing the will to live. <laughs> uh, it's, it's better than cooking this rubbish. Anyway, we are finished. It is a, it's a fox stew. Oh. And oh, it's a stew that fox you, anyway. <laughs> Quickly, finally, we just do this, and this again, and this once more till it gets a big laugh, <laughs> and we have finished. Have we? No. No. <laughs> but I think our time's up. Yes, I think so in many ways. And we'll... 
career-wise, yes. <laughs> right now, your turn, Barry and Andy. Once again, I want you to assume the roles of celebrity and celebrity chef, but your equipment will comprise some kitchen scissors, a meat tenderizer, a saucepan, a toaster, and a microwave oven. You, Andy, are the chef Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> and you, Barry, are Abby Titmus. <laughs> if I may say so, inspired casting. <laughs> Off you go. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen... In nightmare. <laughs> and I'd just like to welcome Abby to me. Actually, Abby, you come across a bit differently as to how I, I thought you come across on the telly. What are you on about? <laughs> well, it's always uh, best. You should never cook uh, without some nice wine to drink. So, Abby, why don't you open us a, a nice bottle of wine? <sighs> good. I've, I've never seen a bottle open that way before. <laughs> Does, does that not hurt your thighs? <laughs> Never mind that. Where's the cork gone? What are we going to cook, Abby? What, what, well, what? I, I, thought, I thought something simple. Simple you know? would be good, I think. Egg yeah. on toast, sort of, like. Egg on toast. All right, well, let's start by uh, breaking the eggs. You break the eggs, there? Break the eggs. Break the eggs. Right, there. right. No. No. Abby, give me the f***ing hammer. <laughs> it's, not, it's not how you break eggs, is it? All right, let's, let's go simply. Let's do um, eggs on toast. All right, all okay, right. what do you need to make toast? Bread? Yeah, yeah, so put it in the toaster, put it in the toaster. Right. Now that's the f***ing eggs. You, you <laughs> <laughs> Eng dozy cow. Got to hurry you along now, quick. Fill the pan, fill hurry the saucepan. Hurry up, hurry up. Fill the saucepan. Come on, hurry up. Fill the saucepan. Yeah, I meant with water. <laughs> we can't. That's not hygienic. We can't cook in that. Why don't you, <laughs> you, <laughs> king of aggies? Can I just say I don't think it's very ladylike to swear like that. <laughs> I'm off. And that's um, Le Fala Titmus, everybody. And next week, my guest is Wayne King <laughs> Rooney. The teams are going to take a look now at some Welsh proverbs in the round called Welsh Proverbs. <laughs> OK, teams, I've brought along the opening lines from a series of proverbs translated from the medieval Welsh, which I shall invite you to complete. To read the proverbs in their original Welsh, please welcome the theatre's manager, Gareth Owen. The first proverb is for you, Tony, and it's A heiodd rain na cherdded yn droed noeth. Which translated is he, he who lays thorns upon the floor Knows what he bought his sandals for. <laughs> Very nearly spot on. Should not go barefoot past the door. <laughs> Tim, this is your Welsh proverb. Ni lwydd cell goris deddwraig. The wife who all the day doth rest gets to know the milkman best. <laughs> Again, very close. Ah. The answer is seldom of dairies has the best. <laughs> Andy, your Welsh proverb now. Diriaid a gaif ddrain an eiwd. If you wicked are and cruel... Join Ofsted and shut down a school. <laughs> the actual answer is pins you'll swallow with your gruel. <laughs> and finally, Barry. Haid roi deas i achtid. If a stranger asks advice, suddenly speak in Welsh. <laughs> no, it's answer true and in a trice. Ooh. Here are some for any of you to have a go at. Ni elwir karain ni ganiv. 
We call him not clever, who... Who calls his manhood Trevor. John Thomas was Welsh, wasn't he? <laughs> he should have said, Prospereth never. Here's another. Gwell gwichior colydd. Better to hear your bowels squeak than... than to wonder where the gerbil is. <laughs> The answer is, feel a blush upon the cheek. <laughs> and Sorry. finally... Gwell anghenawg mor nag anghenawg mynydd. Better at sea to be helpless tossed... ..than have it done on land at twice the cost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, then, upon unknown mountains lost. Well, I notice it's very nearly the end of the show. <laughs> but there's just time to squeeze in a round of Highway Code songbook. Samantha tells me she has to nip out now as she's giving driving lessons to her new gentleman friend. He's a bit nervous about joining fast major roads, but Samantha says he'll soon learn how to pull out for a 50-mile-an-hour spurt. <laughs> So while she's away coping with that, I'll invite the teams to suggest titles of songs likely to appeal to anyone taking their driving test. Andy, will you start, please? Red and yellow and pink and green, orange and purple and blue, is not the sequence of a traffic light. <laughs> so I'm afraid you failed, Mr. Prendergast. <laughs> Desmond Decker with his rear lights. <laughs> <laughs> Examiner. Du, 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 du. Examiner. Du, 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 du. Examiner. Du, 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 du. <laughs> Itsy bitsy, teedy weedy, yellow polka dot Lamborghini. <laughs> Breaking up hill is so very hard to do. <laughs> Once, twice, three times I failed it. <laughs> River deep, mountain high. Try to avoid them if you can, Mr. Prendergast. Do you know the way to San Jose? <laughs> Is this the way to Amarillo? <laughs> Gear stick on your collar. <laughs> but you probably noticed that. <laughs> Break fast at Tiffany's. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, as the fluffy newborn chick of hope tumbles from the eggshell of life and splashes into the hot frying pan of doom, <laughs> I notice it's the end of the show. So from myself, Samantha, the teams, and the fine folk of Rill, it's goodbye. Barry Cryer, Andy Hamilton, Tim Brooke Taylor and Tony Brooks were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Dennis King setting Selman to music. Program consultant was Ian Pattinson, producer was John Naismith. I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Dennis King, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us for a second week in the fine seaside town of Rill in North Wales. The Welsh coast is noted as the last place in Britain to have been invaded by foreign troops. In 1797, a French naval force landed to be greeted by local women in their traditional scarlet costume and tall black hats. 
The French took them for British redcoats and fled. <laughs> Clearly terrified that they'd inadvertently invaded Butlins. <laughs> During the Industrial Revolution, Brill became a centre of brick making, and by the beginning of the 20th century, many thousands of tons of bricks were going to Manchester to build housing and to Liverpool to prop cars up. <laughs> And if I apologise now, can I not have to go to Liverpool? <laughs> Nearby, St Asaph boasts the smallest cathedral in Britain. This is open to visitors only on Wednesdays, as that's when they take it out of the fish tank for cleaning. <laughs> The six miles of golden sands here were host to the Wright brothers who demonstrated their new flying machine in 1907. Visitors to the town's museum will find photographs of Wilbur sat at the controls in his flying suit and Orville sat on his lap in a duck costume. <laughs> Famous names associated with Rill include Carol Vorderman, whom locals remember had a Saturday job in the chemist's on Flint Street. One recalls her selling him some ointment for an embarrassing itch on his consonant, vowel, consonant, <laughs> consonant. As a student in 1897, the young Albert Einstein spent the summer here in Rill and began to formulate his general theory of relativity as he worked the season DJing under the stage name of MC Squared. <laughs> The radio, the radio pioneer Marconi made the first ever wireless broadcast from the top of the water tower here with the words, help, I'm stuck up a water tower. <laughs> but Marconi isn't alone in reminding Rill of the early days of wireless broadcast disasters. <laughs> Let's meet the teams. They are, on my left, Barry Cryer and Andy Hamilton. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Tony Hawkes. And, and ready to jump into action as the team's points go up, please welcome our delightful scorer, the ever-fragrant Samantha. Okay, we start with a new round about the honours system. And this game does exactly what it says on the tin. May cause drowsiness. <laughs> the teams have been perusing the new honours list and I'd like them to share with us any interesting new members of the nobility they may have spotted. Andy, would you care to start, please? Right, for services to Norfolk painting and decorating, <laughs> uh, it'll be finished by Tuesday. <laughs> Tim. For services to drinking and butchery, this man is no longer Mr. Osis, but is now Sir Osis of the Liver. <laughs> Barry. For services to Tory party, Lord Elpis. <laughs> Tony. For services to poor quality South African locksmiths. <laughs> oh, yeah. Marquis won't fit in the door. <laughs> For services to racial stereotyping, Lordy, 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 Lordy. lordy. <laughs> Boy George is henceforth to be known as Lord and Lady Boy George. <laughs> <laughs> For services to Carol Vorderman, Countdown. <laughs> I watched Countdown once and I got aroused. Yeah. It's only seven letters. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Livingston, MBE, it's because I'm a Londoner. 
Okay, the teams are going to sing along now to some discs in the round called Pick Up Song. Each singer will be provided with a well-known song which has been personally selected by Samantha. Samantha spends many hours down in the gramophone library researching discs for this round with the kindly old archivist. However, the nature of her duties has become the subject of a certain amount of ribald comment of late. Therefore, to avoid any unfortunate misunderstanding, I shall self-censor the account of this week's visit. So, Samantha went to fetch the team's discs earlier, and da di 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 da da di da di da di da di da and kept them spinning at 45 revolutions per minute. Samantha is now poised in DJ mode and ready to spin the team's discs. Each should sing along to the record until, at my signal, Samantha turns the volume down. If on the music return you're within a gnat's crotchet of the original teams, I'll be awarding points, and points mean prizes. Knock, knock. <laughs> oh, dear. This week's prize is just the thing to delight the small rodent enthusiast who likes to keep his pets minty fresh. It's this bottle of Listerine mouse wash. <laughs> Andy, you can start this, and I'd like you to accompany Dave Edmonds singing I Hit. You now, Tim, I want you to accompany the streets singing their hit song, Dry Your Eyes. In one single moment, your whole life can turn around. I stand there for a minute, staring straight into the ground. Looking to the left slightly, then looking back down. World feels like it's caved in. Proper sorry, Fran. Please let me know where you, we could only be for us. I can change and I can grow. We could just adjust. The wicked thing about it is we always have trust. We can even have an open relationship, if you must. I look at her, she stares almost straight back at me. But her eyes glide over, she, she's looking straight through me. Then her eyes must have closed for what seems like an eternity. When they open up, she's looking down at her feet. Dry your eyes, mate. I know it's hard to take, but her mind has been made up. There's plenty more fish in the sea. Dry your eyes, mate. I know one. Yeah. Okay, you now, Barry. I'd like you to accompany Desmond Decker singing Israelites. <laughs> Get up in the morning, morning sleeping for breakfast, so that, that every mouth can be fed. Poor me, the Israelites are. Ah. <laughs> Get up in the morning, slaving for bread, sir, so that every mouth can be fed. Poor me. The Israelite My wife and my kids They are packed up Believe me Darling she said I was yours to be seen For me What? Hum, hum, I should point out I'm not Jewish I think Desmond Decker was singing it at the wrong speed. Oh, he's wrong. <laughs> Finally, Tony, would you please accompany Jimmy Somerville and the Communards singing Don't Leave Me This Way. <laughs> I pray for the music to come back in. 
as the teams put that behind them, let's move on to sound charades. Listeners might be interested to learn that this was developed from the old TV show called Give Us a Clue. (laughs) Then again, they might not. (laughs) Ours is a spoken version of the original game where teams mimed titles of songs and films. The past master of the game was, of course, Lionel Blair, who regularly amazed and delighted his teammates with his mime portrayals of the songs and movies of the so-called black exploitation genre. Eunice Stubbs' eyes were out on stalks as she witnessed Lionel using his hands on Isaac Hayes' shaft for two minutes. <laughs> Tim, and Tony, Tim and Tony, you're to start, please, and your title will shortly be displayed to the audience via the laser display screen. For listeners at home, here's the mystery voice. Death of a salesman. Death of a salesman. Right, you're guessing this one, Barry and Andy. Off you go, Tim and Tony. It's four words and it's a play and it goes something like this. Oh, what are you doing in this graveyard then? Well, I I like just looking at uh, all the graveyards. So do I, actually. Yeah, look at that one over there. Is it George Smith, um, Ironmonger, who kicked the bucket? Oh, right. Right, yeah. Yes, uh, there's a sumo wrestler there and went belly up. Yeah. <laughs> What's that one over there? Can you see it? Uh, that one over there, that's uh, that's a Miller, actually. That Miller? One. Really? Yeah, he's brown bread. Right. Uh, but he only worked three and a half days a week. Well, so he's um, half a Miller. Half a Miller, yeah. yeah right. Half a Miller. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, what's this... Uh, I don't know if what this man did. It just said um, yeah. he sold out. Oh, oh, right, yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. The end. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I've got this. Is, is, is there a play called Death by Terrible Pun? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. Was Arthur Miller of relevance? Mm. Yes. You know, I, I think you're going to get this. A quite view soon. from the bridge. <laughs> no. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Was it. Death of a salesman. Yeah! Yeah. Right, your turn, Barry and Andy. Your title's now being exhibited on the laser display board. Here again is the mystery voice for listeners at home. Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Two words. It's been in every medium, actually, Mm. hasn't it? Television, film, book. Mm -hmm. and uh... Most famously, television. Yes, most famously, yes. (laughs) Right, here we go. Hello! <laughs> you, you'll have had your tea! <laughs> what? <laughs> I said you'll have had your tea! Well, that's, that's none of your business. What's that going to do with you? I'm just, I'm well, just... Pardon me for breathing. I'm just trying to welcome a visitor to the village. All right, well, that's, you know, I've got no time for small talk. I'm in your village, but I've got a problem. I need to see a GP, a general practitioner. Is there one close by? Are you in luck? Just look over there. What? what? <laughs> what by the tree? In the tree. <laughs> uh, well, the only thing I can see in the tree is an owl. That's him. (laughs) Uh, So you seriously telling me that that owl over there is a fully qualified general practitioner? Exactly. Would you like some tea? (laughs) I don't want any bloody tea. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) I went for Hollyoaks, Dr Kildare. What have you got? Doctor? Well, uh, it's clearly some sort of... Oh. Yeah. Doctor. Yes, oh, doctor, great. Well, I don't know how you got that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think owls make little those owly noises. Twit to woo. Yes, to Doctor who. To ah. to woo. So it's... It's Doctor Who! 
I can't help but notice the spate of child psychology programs on TV at the moment, such as Super Nanny and House of the Tiny Tearaways. With so many programs showing us how parents fail to cope with their little brats' tantrums, we'll soon have no need to visit supermarkets at all. <laughs> it can be no coincidence that this kind of behaviour has increased since corporal punishment was outlawed in schools. In the first half of the 20th century, we all learned respect out of fear of the cane, and the only violent behaviour you saw then was restricted to two world wars and the destruction of most of Europe. <laughs> Ever mindful of the problems associated with modern-day parenting, I'll ask the teams to assume the role of super nannies and to provide expert answers to some frequently asked questions associated with child-rearing. Actually, our own Tim Brooke Taylor once worked as a child psychologist, but growing tired of the constant screaming fits and lack of toilet training, his employers sacked him. <laughs> Tim, you can start. You can provide an answer to this frequently asked parent inquiry. Are there any signs that are guaranteed to send my baby off to sleep? Yes. Uh, and now on Radio 4, it's time for quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> the actual answer is the sound of a fan or a vacuum cleaner usually does the trick. In my experience, a fan alone does the trick. <laughs> The last time I heard you, you were in Badney Salterton in 1954. <laughs> you know, Barry, can you help some concerned parents by answering this question? Is there an inexpensive way to keep a young child entertained on a long aeroplane flight? Let's play Hunt the Bomb. <laughs> I have to tell the audience here and in, at home that all these uh, answers come from an actual book, serious book. And the answer to that is draw a smiley face on the flight sick bag to make an instant hand puppy. <laughs> well, I can imagine every easy jet flight now. You're going to see everyone. Oh, also, do you use the sick bag as a puppet before or after yes. it's been used as a sick bag? Oh, Let's who's done this? this? Andy, what about this question? My child has chicken pox. Is there anything I can do to make the experience less miserable for him? Give his sister typhoid. <laughs> <laughs> The answer is yes, when it's time to apply the calamine lotion, dip some into a pot and give your child a paintbrush. <laughs> he will have great fun joining the dots. <laughs> okay, Tony, can you answer this question, please? How can I ensure accurate aim when my little boy goes to the toilet? Rest the rifle on the edge of the sink. <laughs> the answer is drop a cork in the toilet and encourage him to try to hit it. Well, that's it. I'm going to try that. Mm. It doesn't work for Barry, though, does it? <laughs> Here are some questions for any of you to have a go at. How can I ensure that my child can still find me on a crowded beach? Take your clothes off and tell him to go where all the shouting is. <laughs> Screaming at you, probably. The answer is tie a helium balloon to your deck chair. Where's Mum? She's up 5,000 feet. <laughs> She's making a puppet out of a silly <laughs> Last one. The last one. How can I minimise the distress to my little boy when he wets the bed? Send him up to the shallow end. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is in two parts. Oh. One, have clean pyjamas ready. Two, put a plastic sheet under the cotton sheet and then a further plastic sheet and cotton sheet on top of these. If the top two layers are wet, simply whip them off and the bed will be ready again. And you'll be drenched from head to foot. <laughs> okay, it's 
music time now with Swanee Kazoo. This is where the teams combine the soothing lilt of the Swanee whistle with the cheeky rasp of the kazoo. <laughs> this will require piano accompaniment. Now, as Colin Sell can't be here tonight, we're very lucky to get Dennis King in his place. Hang on. I'll say that again. As Colin Sell can't be here, we're very lucky. To get Dennis King in his place is truly a pleasure. <laughs> okay, you're the Sartonian team, and I'd like you to provide me with a rendition of the song I'd Do Anything from the musical Oliver to feature Tony Hawk's on Kazoo and Tim Brooke Taylor on Swanee Whistle. <laughs> Your turn, Barry and Andy. Your song is Big Spender, and it's to feature Barry Cryer on kazoo and Andy Hamilton on Swanee Whistle. gentlemen, I notice it's, it's very nearly the end of the show, but there's, just, there's just time to squeeze in a round of Welsh Film Club. <laughs> Samantha has to nip out now as she's off to meet her new Welsh gentleman friend who's offered to drive her around the area. She hopes she's going to take her to Colwyn Bay and bang her in the back of his van. <laughs> pronounced that way. No. You can start this one, Tony. Bend it like Brecon. <laughs> Tim. The big sheep. <laughs> Barry. Clan fire poking with go gare if you drop with clan to silly or go go gox stock and two smoking barrow. <laughs> Tappy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> the lung did know that time forgot. <laughs> A fish called Rhonda. <laughs> For your I Steadford only. <laughs> Hello, Dolly. Hello, <laughs> Dolly. Oedipus Wrexham. How green was my vachy? <laughs> Crouching Tiger Bay, hidden Welsh dragon. <laughs> when Harry met Sachley. <laughs> a cat on a prestatin roof. <laughs> the Buddy Hockley story. 
bring me the head of Alfredo Jenkins. <laughs> Evan can wait. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Aberystwyth. <laughs> And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the show. And I think you'll agree, it certainly ticked all the boxes. <laughs> Particularly those marked terrible and rubbish. <laughs> I'd like to add a personal valediction, because it's the only one I know in Welsh. Blue thin with that. <laughs> ah. And with that, it's goodbye from the teams, myself, Samantha, and the good folk of Rill. Goodbye. Barry Pryor, Andy Hamilton, Tim Brooke Taylor and Tony Hawkes have been given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Dennis King setting some of them to music. The programme consultant was Ian Pattinson, the producer was John Naismith. <laughs> Present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell and your chairman is Humphrey Nittleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us this week in the new theatre Oxford, the city of dreaming spires. As the name implies, Oxford was once well known for rearing oxen. According to Delia Smith's History of English Foods, the meat of a certain part of the ox was considered a delicacy that could provide a nutritious family meal, if it was well hung. <laughs> during, during Tudor times, the Protestant bishops Latimer and Ridley were burnt alive here in 1555, followed by Archbishop Cranmer the following summer. After an investigation, it was discovered that the General Synod Events Committee had bought a faulty barbecue. <laughs> in, the early in the early 1700s, Edmund Halley came to Oxford, where he calculated that a huge comet would appear in 1987. And sure enough, in August that year, exactly as predicted, one opened next to B&Q. <laughs> In the 1880s, Oxford's first horse-drawn trams were introduced, operating along the Banbury Road. In 1910, these old slow conveyances were converted by Morris Motors to run on electricity. It was amazing how they speeded up when the horses had 240 volts. <laughs> Tim Henman was born nearby, and as a young... <laughs> triumph of optimism over <laughs> Tim Henman was born nearby and as a young lad developed his tennis skills by playing alone against the side of his parents' house. One recalls his first tournament when he got all the way through to the semi-finals only to be beaten in straight sets by a garage door. <laughs> But it's all too easy to mock those who, despite their best efforts, seem constantly to fail. <laughs> Let's meet the teams. They are on my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Harry Hill. And... Please welcome a lady who's been my right hand for many years now and who, who gives us all a lift. It's the delightful Samantha. Okay, let's get underway with a look at the English language, as it's important to understand the subtleties of meaning of certain words. For example, there are many who don't fully appreciate the difference between the terms perpetrate and commit. Well, perpetrate means to perform or to be responsible for an act of criminal intent or deception. 
whereas Comet was the frog on the muppet show. <laughs> But the meanings of words are constantly shifting, and I'd like the teams to share with us any new definitions they may have spotted recently. Barry, would you care to start, please? Um, asbestos. Greek antisocial behavior order. <laughs> Tim. Philander, the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen. <laughs> Graham. Semolina, a system of signalling with puddings. <laughs> Harry. Pistachio, the facial hair you might find on the top lip of an alcoholic. <laughs> Delegate, Jewish scandal. Systematic, a robot nun. <laughs> Stymie, a Jewish pig. <laughs> Boomerang, show displeasure to a dessert. <laughs> Scurrilous, a mouse with no legs. Aerobic, chocolate biro. <laughs> Shrewd, a rude shrew. <laughs> Baltimore, asking for seconds in an Indian restaurant. <laughs> Shrink, an ice skating shrew. <laughs> Increment, bad Japanese weather. <laughs> Chinchilla, air conditioned beard. <laughs> Shrub, an over friendly shrew. <laughs> okay, stretching. Honolulu, you. to give an MBE to a Scottish singer. <laughs> It's music time now with one song to the tune of another. <laughs> and this will be a rare treat for music lovers everywhere. There's no radio games like this one. Wait a minute, I'll read that again. A rare treat for music lovers. Everywhere there's no radio. <laughs> <laughs> games like this one require a certain special kind of talent. To swap the words of one song with those of another takes the ability to ignore all the conventional rules of musical composition, harmony, and melody. Fortunately, we have a world-class expert in, <laughs> in the shape of Colin Sell. Actually, listeners may be interested to learn that Colin spent many years working with Johnny Cash. Somebody had to empty those condom machines. <laughs> Okay, Tim, we'll start with you. Will you please sing the words of My Dingaling by Chuck Berry to the tune of When I Was a Lad from Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. <laughs> When I was a little bitty boy, my grandfather bought me a cute little toy. Silver bells hanging on a string, she told me it was my ding a ling ling. She told me it was a ding a ling a ling. My ding a ling ling, my ding a ling ling. I want you to play with my ding a ling ling. His ding a ling ling, his ding a ling. He wants you to play with the ding a ling. And then Mama told me to do grammar school I stopped off in the vestibule Every time that bell would ring They'd catch me playing with my ding-a-ling They'd catch him playing with his ding-a-ling My ding-a-ling, my ding-a-ling I want you to play with my ding-a-ling His ding-a-ling, his ding-a-ling He wants you to play with his ding-a-ling
Okay, you now, Graham, would you sing the words of Bicycle Race by Queen to the tune of Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind? <laughs> Bicycle, bicycle, bicycle I want to ride my bicycle, bicycle, bicycle I want to ride my bicycle I want to ride my bike I want to ride my bike I want to ride it where I like You say black I say white You say bark I say bye Brought a lump to the eye and a tear to the throat. <laughs> and finally, Harry, would you sing the words of Old MacDonald Had a Farm to the tune of the Eagles song Hotel California? <laughs> I give it a go. Chick chick, <laughs> oh MacDonald. Okay, the teams are going to play a good old-fashioned board game now. Personally, my favourite as a child was Monopoly. What more innocent fun could there be than to enjoy a silly fantasy world in which it's possible to buy up railway gas and electricity companies for a song? <laughs> with a view to massively overcharging the unsuspecting customer. <laughs> the game is an exciting new medical version of the popular Scrabble board game, and Samantha is passing around the boards and letters for the teams now. Hurry up. <laughs> okay, Harry, would you care to start? Uh, yes. I've got... Uh, oh, I've got a load of blanks and... Uh, oh, it's okay, I've got IVF. I've got IVF. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a pi, P-I, I don't... Uh, Ian and L and S. Oh, that means I've got piles. <laughs> oh, that's not good. Well, I can use that P to make biceps. Or oh, biceps. No, that's not how you spell it. Bypass, I can do. Bypass. <laughs> Takes me onto a triple word sky. I've got triple bypass. <laughs> yeah. You could have used that P for analysis, you know. I could. <laughs> I've got far pharmacy. Oh no, there's no F in pharmacy. <laughs> I've got no L's, no K's, no T's. Uh, <laughs> basically, I'm in consonant. <laughs> uh, oh dear, with this triage system, I don't think I can go for about a week. <laughs> Oh, 
What have I got? Oh, I've got M R S A. I can't make anything of that. No. <laughs> I'm just going to move these vowels. <laughs> um, <laughs> got care. Oh no, I've got an L there. I can make that clear. <laughs> this is all being taped, you know. <laughs> what a waste of perfectly good magnetism. I can't help but notice that the science fiction revival is all the rage these days. Actually, serious research scientists constantly grapple to achieve time travel. They should come and sit where I'm sitting. <laughs> that would take them back four or five decades for a start. <laughs> In the next game, the teams are going to assume the roles of actors to reprise some famous two-handers from film and stage. However, one of the parts has been cast as an alien. Hmm. Okay, the first scene is from the start of Brief Encounter, and it's to feature Tim as Doctor Who in the Trevor Howard role, and Harry as a Dalek in the Celia Johnson role. <laughs> Where you go. Can I help you? Please let me look. I happen to be the doctor. That's very kind of you. Look, turn round to the light, please. Now look up. Now look down. Keep still. I see it. There. Oh, what a relief. It was agonizing. <laughs> it looks like a bit of grit. It was when the express went through. Thank you very much indeed. How lucky you happened to be. Anybody could have done it. Never mind, you did, and I'm most grateful. Uh, there's my train, I must go. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Your turn now, Barry and Graham. You'll be performing a scene from The Importance of Being Earnest, featuring Barry as Obi Wan Kenobi, <laughs> playing Jack Worthing and Graham as Darth Vader, playing the part of Lady Bracknell. I have lost both my parents. <laughs> both. That seems like carelessness. <laughs> Who was your father? I'm afraid I don't really know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said, I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I was, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? <laughs> it... <laughs> in a handbag. Lady Bracken. I God was... sees him. <laughs> An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. The Brighton Line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing, I confess. Jack, I am your father. <laughs> Oh, 
Our next round takes us overseas to see what we can adapt from Britain to suit our European neighbours. Personally, I'm fascinated by European culture. For example, in the French language, they have a word rien, which means nothing. <laughs> and yet, as the Prime Minister discovered recently, the French have more than 20 different ways to say both up and yours. <laughs> Okay, teams, in an effort to restore our crumbling political and economic links, I'd like you please to help solve the terrible European nursery rhyme shortage by adapting some to suit our neighbours, or indeed for any other deserving nations farther afield. Would you please start, Barry? From the Republic of Ireland, Barry. <laughs> Simple Simon met a pieman going to the fair. Said Simple Simon to the pieman, what have you got there? Pies. <laughs> Graham. Veni vidi vinky runs through the town. <laughs> Upstairs and downstairs in his nightgown, rapping at the window, crying through the lock, are the children all in their own beds, for this is not Neverland, you know? <laughs> this is very popular in Spain. You shall have a fishy on a little dishy. You shall have a fishy when the Spanish trawler men get back from Cornwall. <laughs> Ole! Harry. <laughs> India, this is for. Okay. Half a pound of tuppany rice, half a pound of treacle. Who ordered the treacle biryani? <laughs> Three blind mice see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Et voila, French provincial cuisine. <laughs> Here's one for the UK. Lavender's blue diddle diddle, lavender's green. When I am king diddle diddle, you will be the Duchess of Cornwall. <laughs> and one from down under. One, two, kangaroo. Three, four, there's some more. Kangaroo. Five, six, kangaroo. Seven, eight. Kangaroo. <laughs> Nine, ten, a big fat kangaroo. <laughs> the teams are going to take us back to a golden age of letter writing now. Letter writing these days has all but died out with the advent of email and mobile phones, but I have to say I find this technology a little baffling. Only this week my mobile phone company tried to get me to download the crazy frog. Who the hell wants Jack Chirac in a crash helmet with no problem? <laughs> okay, in an attempt to reverse this trend, each team will take turns to improvise letters between two famous people. Team A start by improvising a letter one word each at a time. When they've signed off, Team B should compose the reply. We'll examine the lost correspondence between God and Noah. You can start us off, please, Barry and Graham. Dear Noah, I am writing as I find that you have an unusual ark <laughs> that lies near your home. <laughs> Why you have got an ark is beyond me. <laughs> and I will demand that you remove it <laughs> immediately. Otherwise, I shall be forced to take action <laughs> with regard to the planning. <laughs> of this aforesaid arc. <laughs> Furthermore, oh. here lies <laughs> the remnants of my weather <laughs> forecast. <laughs> Rain falling for three or four forty <laughs> nights and then floods <laughs> will engulf you and quite rightly too. <laughs> Yours 
celestially. God. Dear God. <laughs> Re the flood to engulf us. I have managed to amass a number of animals. <laughs> Namely... <laughs> Two of each animal, which I list now. <laughs> Adva. <laughs> and... <laughs> Ants. And <laughs> ant eaters, <laughs> and bees, and cuckoos, and ducks, and elephants, <laughs> and so we <laughs> continue down this path of self pity. <laughs> Lots of love, Noah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's very nearly the end of another show, but it's just time to squeeze in a round of Babies and Toddlers' Songbook. Now, Barry Cryer may be at something of an advantage here, as he currently has his little grandson staying with him. Every morning, he's been strapping him into his buggy and wheeling him down to the park where he likes to chase the ducks. <laughs> the poor fellow says he's exhausted. <laughs> Pushing Barry around all day. <laughs> So, teams, suggestions of song titles, please, with the aim of delighting an audience of babies and toddlers. Graham, will you start, please? It's my potty, and I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> Tim. Knowing pee, knowing poo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, my and papa, not you, Mr. Blanket. <laughs> Sweets for my sweet, Valium for my mummy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over my friend. <laughs> There's a kind of rusk all over the wall tonight. <laughs> Voodoo childminder. <laughs> I just crawled to say I love you. <laughs> ah. I call my wind Mariah. Down at the old cow and gate. <laughs> Teats for two. <laughs> In case you have twins. Pampers got a brand new bag. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, as the runaway stallion of time attempts to mount the reluctant mayor of fate, <laughs> and the town council meeting has to be halted for the day. I notice it's the end of the show, so from myself, Samantha, the teams, and the fine folk of Oxford, it's goodbye. Tim Brooke Taylor, Barry Cryer, Graham Gardner, and Harry Hill were being given silly things to do by... We present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us for a second week in the new theatre in Oxford, a fine historic city with much to offer. No introduction to Oxford would be complete without a mention of its world-famous university. So that's that done. <laughs> During the Civil War, Oxford was a royalist stronghold, and it was from here that Prince Rupert's cavalry rode north to fight Cromwell's forces at the Battle of Birmingham. 
The roundheads lost, and so were forced to keep it. <laughs> the Reverend Dr. Spooner lived and lectured here in Oxford. As a boating enthusiast, he spent many hours renovating and maintaining local watercraft. And what a reaction there was from the Women's Institute when, along with his boatman, Dr. Spooner presented his lecture, Care of Punts. <laughs> William Morris, later Lord Nuffield, established car manufacture in Oxford in 1913. His first model was the famous Bullnose Morris, so-called because his name was Morris and he wore a large brass ring through his nose. <laughs> The Morris organization laid the foundations of what later became Austin Morris, then BMC, then British Leyland, then Jaguar Leyland, then Jaguar Rover, then MG Rover, and finally the Tsing Hao Kak... <laughs> the Tsing Hao Kak Shanghai Trading Corporation, bracket in receivership, end of bracket, limited. Sadly now gone, the company once provided steady employment for generations of sign writers. <laughs> Colin Dexter, the author and creator of Inspector Morse, lives and works here. As we follow the Morse stories on TV, the greatest mystery is, of course, why so many people die in Oxford. <laughs> it won't take a detective to understand, as I say. Let's meet the team. <laughs> They are on my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Harry Hill. And quick to react when the team's points are on the rise, please welcome our delightful scorer, the ever-fragrant Samantha. We start today with a round of mottos. Teams, I'd like you please to suggest mottos likely to be adopted by certain societies, businesses, or other organizations. Graham, you can start. Um, the Anger Management Club. <laughs> Don't get us started. <laughs> Tim, the Hampshire Society, better safe than sorry. <laughs> Barry. The uh, Turkey Breeders Association, <laughs> Norfolk and Good. <laughs> Harry. The Federation of Life Support Machine Manufacturers, Tubes Help You Breathe More Easily. <laughs> the Pond Builders Guild may contain newts. <laughs> I am not a number, I am a human being. That's the motto of the Rod Stewart Ex-Wives Club. <laughs> this is the London Olympic Bid Committee. See you in Paris. <laughs> the Society for the Reintroduction of Victorian Values. The car in front is a horse. <laughs> <laughs> The Reincarnation Society, same chairman for 250 years. <laughs> I'm going to give you 10 marks for that, Tim, <laughs> so that I can deduct 12. <laughs> the Amalgamated Union of Female Escort Users. <laughs> I liked her so much I bought her company. Before the next round, I have to introduce for one show only an assistant chairman. So please welcome Little Humph. Thank you, thank you. That's very kind. I should stress that mine is only a monitoring role. Try to pretend I'm not here. That shouldn't be much of a chore. Who's that? That's my sidekick, Little Colin. Stop that awful din at once. Hey, 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 don't be too harsh on him. He's only a little boy. 
That was me, actually, hon. <laughs> really? You're improving. Okay, the teams are going to sing for us now in the round called Excruciating Torture. As this... As this involves their singing along to some well-known discs, it's also known as pick-up song. <laughs> Samantha spent a few hours down in the gramophone library researching the team's discs earlier and took her little dog with her. She likes to dress the little thing in her own stylish canine clothing range and the elderly archivists say they all appreciate her doggy fashion. <laughs> Samantha is now back and poised in DJ mode over the record desk, ready to give the discs a spin. You should sing along with the records teams until at my signal Samantha turns the volume down, and if on the music's return you're within a gnat's crotchet of the original, I'll be avoiding points, and points mean prizes. You can do it when you... <laughs> These are the future leaders of the country. <laughs> This week's prize is guaranteed to give the busy executive a vigorous workout as he sleeps. It's this luxury double bed with interior sprung mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you're to start and I'd like you to accompany the monkeys singing I'm a Believer. What love was only true in fairy tales Meant for someone else but not for me Love was out to get me, that's the way it seemed. Discipline went haunted all my dreams. Then I saw her face, now I'm a believer. Not a trace of doubt in my mind, I'm in love. Ooh, I'm a believer, I couldn't leave her if I tried. I'm a believer. <laughs> Okay, you're next, Graham. I'd like you to accompany Emil Ford singing What Do You Want to Make Those... Blah, blah, blah. I'd like you to... Uh, Graham, I'd like you to yeah. accompany... No. Wait. Go on. I want to... Are we cut... there yet? <laughs> Don't forget what they did to Jimmy Young. I'd like you to accompany Emil Ford, Graham, singing What Do You Want to Make Those Eyes at Me For? What do you want to make those eyes at me for If they don't mean what they say they make me glad, they make me sad They make me learn a lot of things that I never had You're fooling around with me now Well, you leave me on and then you run away Well, that's all right I'll get you a lonesome night and a baby you'll find You're messing with dynamite So what do you want to make those eyes at me for? If they don't mean what they say. Okay, you now, Barry, would you accompany Marlene Dietrich singing, <laughs> singing You Do Something to Me? And I'll do something to you I'm saying that simply mystifies me Barry, you're a bit flat Piss off, <laughs> tell me Why should it be You have the power to hypnotize me I was only being orders Let me 
Live neath your spell I'm 98, you know Do, do that Voodoo that You do So well For You Do the to me, what? <laughs> It's a man, I tell you And finally... When does quote-unquote come back? <laughs> come back, Herod, all is forgiven. <laughs> What was a goodie? <laughs> finally, would you, Harry, please accompany Tony Orlando and Dawn singing Knock Three Times? Yes. Ready, Dawn? Off you go. Hey girl, what you doing down there? Dancing alone every night while I live right above you. Two, three, four. I can hear your music playing. I can feel your body swaying. One floor above me, you don't even know me, I love you. Oh, my darling, knock three times on the ceiling if you want me. Da -da -da -da. Twice on the pipe, if the answer is no. Oh, my sweetness, means you'll meet me in the hallway. Whoa, twice on the pipe <laughs> Means you ain't gonna show The teams are going to indulge us in a spot of acting now in the game called Proverbial Theatre. We have to keep a special eye out for Tim and Graham in this one, as I understand both are well-known thespians. In fact, Graham is currently considering several interesting roles, the BBC having generously provided him with a packed lunch. <laughs> Are you a Bill? <laughs> In proverbial theatre, each team will take turns to act out a well-known proverb for the other side to guess. Tim and Harry, you're to start, please, and your proverb will shortly be displayed to the audience via the laser display screen. <laughs> For listeners at home, here's the mystery voice. Many hands make light work. Many hands make light work. How Off you go, Tim and Harry. How many words? How many words? Five. Five? And what are they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. What? What is the matter? The bulb is not working. Is it not working? Then what are we doing to get it better? Well, we need to find out what is wrong with it. Have you assistance? <laughs> well, I could ask my brother. And what is his name? <laughs> oh! It has slipped my mind for a, th <laughs> for a second. Well, let's see what this other brother is called. <laughs> oh, that's easy. That's Hans. Ah, Hans. Can you remember the name of the first one? Wait a minute. It's Hans too. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, and your father was... Uh, he was Dawn. <laughs> yeah. It's a long story. <laughs> And a, and a trip to Brazil. <laughs> But... <laughs> well, Hans, uh, you try the switch. I will turn now. Oh! oh. <laughs> Success! That's... <laughs> okay. Is there a celebrity version of this? <laughs> Yes. Carry on, carry on. It was hands and, and lights. Many hands. Yeah. 
make light time work. Time. <laughs> Right, your turn, Barry and Graham. Your proverb is now being exhibited on the laser display board, and here again is the mystery voice for listeners at home. Change is as good as a rest. Change is as good as a rest. Seven, seven words. words, seven words. And it goes a bit like this. Hamish! Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dougal, you'll have had your tea. <laughs> Well, no, I haven't. But, but look here, whatever are you up to? Well, I was hoping to pot the pink. Oh, I... <laughs> Are you going to finish your game of snooker first? <laughs> <laughs> If only I could. What? No, my... Uh, the, the, the cue ball's hampered by the blue. And? Well, I can't find that thing, you know, that supports the cue. Oh, oh can't well, find it. Well, here's a tip. And now here's a suggestion. <laughs> um... <laughs> a pile of small coins... will prove to be an adequate substitute. <laughs> there we are. Here goes. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. I got the bit is as good as a rest, but I didn't get the first bit. Oh, <laughs> no. 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 Uh, um, change. Um, change. Change, yeah. yeah. It's now time to play the game called Mornington Crescent. <laughs> but first I noticed from the huge pile of correspondence in the listener complaints waste paper basket that we've received a letter from a Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. She writes, Dear Mr. Tarrant, Is it true that in Japan you're known as Mr. Rack of Tarrant? Kind regards, Mrs. Trellis. OK, on with the game. And because of Oxford's associations with royalty, this week we'll be playing Royal Mornington Crescent, a version made fashionable by Charles II on his visit here. The game can be confusing for those unused to the intricacies of etiquette and basic good manners, but here are some useful pointers. Play is strictly in order of social superiority. <coughs> so in this instance, we must start with Tim and end with Barry. <laughs> It's considered a breach of etiquette for players at the lower end of the social order to block, box, reverse, or win the game. <laughs> Royal connections can't double, but common moves, especially Clapham Common, are frowned upon. <laughs> Tim, you can start. Queensway. Graham. Um, so, Cheapside. Harry. Regent Street. Barry. Tooting Common. <laughs> Harry Barry, that's Japanese suicide, isn't it? <laughs> Green Park. Clapham <laughs> Common. No, Clapham South. Oh, 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 oh. Clapham South. Sorry, yeah. I have to take your first answer. All right, Clapham, <laughs> Clapham South. <laughs> Shelf on Latimer. Queensway. Oh, back to where we started. I think that was a reverse. Yeah, but it's a common reverse, so I don't... I suppose he is allowed, is it? What, a common reverse? Yeah. What other kind of reverse is he likely to do? <laughs> well, I can do a posh reverse, so that's Queensway. Baron's Court. Yeah. <laughs> You could do it. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, I'm out of this one now. I'm, I'm all done. <laughs> <laughs> no. I came here in good faith, you know. <laughs> Come on, young and you can do it. What's the point? South Harrow. Oh, very good. Oh, very good. Oh, boy. Play the hunt. Play the hunt. Yeah. 
Oh. Unboxed. Did you know what you, you were doing? are? Unboxed. Unboxed. Uh, oh, well, box, mm. box, cox, cox. Hoxton. It's Martin's Lane. Ooh. Ooh. Um. I see dead people. <laughs> Uh, Earl's Court. Mm. Mm. <coughs> then you've had Earl, you've had Baron. We haven't had... Which depend, depends which... We haven't had those. Viscount. Viscount. That's a, a biscuit, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mornington mark. Crescent! Yes! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, little hunt. Before we start the next round, I've been asked to make a short announcement telling our listeners that repeats of many editions of the show can be heard on BBC Seven. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> As if there's a BBC Seven. <laughs> okay, teams, I've brought along the opening lines of certain famous autobiographies, and I'd like you to guess what the ensuing words might be. Harry, you can start. I'd like you to complete... The start of David Bellamy's autobiography, Jolly Green Giant. I was conceived in the spring of 1932, 100 years after... My mother came off the pill. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is the passing of the Reform Act. Your turn, Tim, and you can finish off the beginning of Greg Dyke's autobiography, Inside Story. As I left home on the morning of Tuesday, the 27th of January, 2004, I had no idea... So it was the same as any other day, really. <laughs> <laughs> and the actual answer is that within 36 hours, my career as Director General of the BBC would be over. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Barry, here's one for you to finish off. It's the start of Michael Heseltine's autobiography, Life in the Jungle. My arrival in the world attracted scant notice, and what little it did took the form of a paid advertisement in the South Wales Evening Post announcing... Baby for sale. <laughs> the actual answer is the birth on the 21st of March 1933 of a son to Rupert and Eileen Heseltine. Ah, And Graham, one for you to complete, it's the opening to Joan Bakewell's autobiography, The Centre of the Bed. I was born on the 16th of April, 1933, at Hooley Range Nursing Home in Heaton Moor in Stockport. I had been conceived in mid... In mid-air, thanks to an... <laughs> thanks to an oversprung mattress. <laughs> Very nearly right. <laughs> the answer is Atlantic, as my parents sailed home on the SS Desiado. Hmm. Here are some for any of you to have a go at. First of all, there's the start of John Burt's autobiography, The Harder Path. I was born in Liverpool in 1944 during an... An obstetric focus group meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is an air raid warning. <laughs> this one's the start of Anne Robinson's autobiography, Unfit Mother. Have a facial once a month and get plenty of help in the house. My mother would advise as I... Push the pillow hard into her face. <laughs> <laughs> and guide yeah. her hand over the will. <laughs> the answer is, was growing up. And finally, can anyone finish off the start of Dale Winton's autobiography? Dale, my story. When I first settled down to write this autobiography, I discovered that somebody else had used the title, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. <laughs> the answer is that, that I'd already written one before. Mm. I noticed it's very nearly the end of the show, but it's just time to fit in a round of Electrical Retailers Film Club. <laughs> Samantha tells me she has to nip out now as she's off to see a new gentleman friend who's in vacuum cleaner sales. He's offered Samantha a good deal on one of his products, and she says she can't wait to handle her new Philips upright. <laughs> so, teams, while she's away enjoying that, I'd like you to suggest titles of movies guaranteed to enthrall an audience drawn from the electrical retail industry. You can start this one, Harry. 
uh, Cassette Blanca. <laughs> Jim and Dimmer. <laughs> Thoroughly modem Millie. <laughs> Everything you always wanted to know about Flex, but were afraid to <laughs> ask. Rebel without an extension cord. <laughs> Lady Chatterley's Hoover. <laughs> Moby Dixon's. <laughs> Jason and, and the Argos catalogue. <laughs> Bring me the plug of Alfredo Garcia. <laughs> Scott face. <laughs> That's it. So, little Humph, did you enjoy yourself? I haven't had so much fun since I had my tonsils out. <laughs> I haven't had so much fun since you had your tonsils out. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the show. <laughs> and indeed, the end of the series. <laughs> but there'll be another one later in the year. So, there's something to look forward to. <laughs> the end of another series. <laughs> and with that, it's goodbye from the teams, myself, Samantha, and the good folk of Oxford. Goodbye. Tim Brooke Taylor, Barry Cryer, Graham Garden, and Harry Hill were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Colin Sell setting some of them to music. The programme consultant was Ian Pattinson, and the producer was John Naismith. We present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Colin Sell, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello and welcome to I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue. You join us today at the Festival Fringe here in Edinburgh, Scotland's fine capital. The city was founded by Edwin of Northumbria and was originally known as Edinburgh, but later the W was dropped. Unpopular with the townsfolk, Edwin sailed for Turkey where they dedicated the city of Ankara to him. <laughs> At the far end of the Royal Mile is Holyrood House and Queen Mary's Bath. History records it's here that Queen Mary bathed up to her waist in fine claret. One courtier who tasted the wine had difficulty describing its flavour, saying there was a hint of something he couldn't put his finger on. <laughs> Famous names associated with Edinburgh include Sir James Young Simpson, who discovered chloroform. Making his revolutionary presentation to the Royal Surgical Academy, its members were reported to be amazed when Sir James brought in several young volunteer nurses and proceeded to knock one out in front of them. <laughs> chloroform, of course, became known as a safe and efficient agent to quickly produce a deep state of anesthesia. It has now been superseded. <laughs> Let's meet the team. <laughs> On my left, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and Ross Noble. And a warm Edinburgh welcome, please, for the lady who loves to score wherever she goes, the ever delightful Samantha. <laughs> The first round is called Uxbridge English Dictionary and takes its title from the popular and best-selling book of the same name. 
As English is a rich and complex language, it's often difficult to understand the subtle but important differences in meaning between certain terms. For example, many people don't appreciate the difference between a napkin and a serviette. Well, those of us who benefited from a private education know that a napkin is a square piece of cloth or paper that's used to wipe the mouth or protect the clothes when eating, whereas a serviette was a bloke from communist Russia. <laughs> However, meanings are constantly shifting, and I'd like the teams to share with us any new definitions they may have spotted recently. Barry, would you care to start, please? Polaroids. Unpleasant ailment in Arctic conditions. <laughs> Routine. An adolescent kangaroo. <laughs> Gyroscope. A device for locating dole money. <laughs> Ross, arsenic, to steal buttocks. <laughs> can can, couple of tins. <laughs> Toucan, couple of tins. <laughs> tin tin. <laughs> Famous cartoon character. <laughs> Disillusion to slag off the work of Paul Daniels. <laughs> Missive. Certificate for very big. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> Good night. Common or garden. A choice between Barry and Graham. <laughs> Missive. Certificate for very big. <laughs> You'd probably better if you did it in the accent, Barry. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Mayfly. BA flight. <laughs> Impolite. A flaming goblin. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Philharmonic to feed the Queen. <laughs> okay, I'll ask the teams to sing for us now. Fool that I am. <laughs> In the round called One Song to the Tune of Another. <laughs> the principle of One Song to the Tune of Another is very much like washing socks. Dunking them in soapy water and giving them a good scrub freshens them up and provides them with a new lease of life, just as tunes are revitalized by new words. But I hear you thinking, teams, won't the song sheets become soggy and liable to fall apart? <laughs> well, there is a traditional machine we could use to squeeze them dry, but why bother when we've got Colin Sell to mangle our <laughs> tunes for us? Okay, well, okay, we'll start with you, Tim. Would you please sing the words of the funky gibbon oh, to, the tune of to the tune of Beethoven's Ode to Joy? <laughs> Where the good is, how do you do? We've just been down to the zoo. We saw a monkey in a cage doing a dance that could be the rage. It's not bad, so let's all do the funky gibbon. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> do, do, do the funky gibbon. We are here to show you how. You now, Ross, would you please sing the words of Sometimes When We Touch to the tune of Scotland the Brave? <laughs> me if I love you and I choke on my reply I'd rather hurt you honestly than mislead you with a lie and who am I to judge you on what you say and do I'm only just beginning to see the real you <laughs> and sometimes when we touch the honesty's too much I have to close my eyes and hide I want to hold you till I die until we both break down and cry I want to hold you till my fear subsides
Okay, Barry, would you sing the words of Bob the Builder to the tune of The Girl from Ipanema? <laughs> but of course. Bob the Builder, can we fix it? Bob the Builder, yes we can. Scoop, muck and dizzy and rolly too. <laughs> Lofty and Wendy join the crew Bob and the gang have so much fun Working together they get the job done <laughs> Bob the Builder, can we fix it? Bob <laughs> the Builder, yes we can Fix it, Bob the Builder. Yes, we can. Time to get busy. Such a lot to do. Building and fixing till it's good as new. Bob and the gang, they can really be found. Working all day till the sun goes down. Bob the Builder. Can we fix it? Bob the Builder. Yes, we can. And finally, Graham, would you please sing the words of the theme to Jim will fix it to the tune of We'll Gather Lilacs. <laughs> Only the start of it. One letter and now you're a part of it. Now you've done it, Jim has fixed it for you. And you and you and you. There must be something that you want to do. The one thing that you've always wanted to Now you've done it, Jim has fixed it for you And you, and you, and you Not bad OK, we move on now to the round called Sound Charades, and this will be a humdinger, or my name's not Pippa Greenwood. <laughs> Listeners may not be aware that Sound Charades was developed from the old TV show called Give Us a Clue, in which teams mimed the titles of films. The show's virtuoso was, without doubt, Lionel Blair. But even he had his off days. His teammates recalled their apprehension during one close-run contest when, in the dying minutes, Lionel was given free willy by Michael Astor. <laughs> of course, he blew it. <laughs> Tim Ross, you're to start, please, and your title will shortly be displayed to the audience via the laser display screen. And here's the mystery voice for listeners at home. Coogan's Bluff. Coogan's Bluff. It's uh, two <laughs> words. Yes. And it's a film. Okay. Oh ha! Steve, I'm pregnant. <laughs> really? Only joking. <laughs> The Partridge family. That's three words. Ah. <laughs> Two words, Partridge. Is it Alan? No. Is it Coogan? Is it Coogan? <laughs> ah. All Coogan's together now. Bluff. Coogan's yeah. Bluff. Yeah. Right, your turn, Barry and Graham. Your title is now being exhibited on the laser display board, and here again is the mystery voice for listeners at home Braveheart. Braveheart. It's a film, Carry and on. it's one word. Right. Dougal. Uh, <laughs> time's up. Aha! Yes, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll have had your tea. Um, now then, let's away for our stroll up the brae. 
I'm with you, old friend. Good. Oh, uh, uh, oh God. What's Is that you? <laughs> I'm afraid so. Oh, it's, uh, no. It always seems to strike me going uphill. Oh, no. it's, it's always oh, on the hell side. Oh, you wait here till the air clears. I'll go. I'll away up ahead. Well, goodbye for now. Goodbye for some time, I think. It's gone with the wind. <laughs> so close. Yeah. It hasn't got brain and fart in it. <laughs> Okay, this next round is all about totally misleading advice, and it's well worth waiting for. (laughs) Get the idea? The team's task here is to become tour guides for international visitors with a massive, missive, sorry, With the massive growth in cheap air travel, flying is no longer the preserve of the well-heeled, genteel classes. I saw a rough type on a British Airways flight recently who'd so overdone the duty-free, he could hardly stand up. In fact, it's a wonder he could fly the plane at all. (laughs) What gave it away was when he got on the intercom and announced, this is your best mate speaking. With the hordes of foreign tourists flocking to Edinburgh at this time of year, the teams thought it might be fun to provide a misleading festival guide. You can start us off, please, Graham. If a bizarrely dressed stranger accosts you with a handful of flyers for a show, it is your duty to carry out a citizen's arrest. <laughs> Tim, going on to London after the festival, remember to stock up with banknotes. London cabbies just love them. <laughs> Policemen are addressed as tip face. <laughs> Ross, remember when chatting up local ladies to use the old Gaelic word for beauty pronounced minger? <laughs> the big issue is free. <laughs> At the tattoo, be sure to bring your own gun. <laughs> Hecklers are more than welcome at John Burt's McTaggart Lecture. (laughs) Visit our parks. These swans are delicious. It's only a short cab ride out to Edinburgh's famous Gatwick Airport. (laughs) If taken ill suddenly, please remember all churches have a box marked for the sick. Late night walking tours of Leith are very popular and the guides are often found standing on street corners. <laughs> Audience participation. When the signets come on in Swan Lake, be the first to join the end of the conga line. <laughs> Our next game was inspired by TV's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And that's inspired in the sense of Alibaba and the 40 inspirers. <laughs> I'm fascinated by the program, but I expect, like me, you occasionally find yourself shouting idiot at the screen and wondering how on earth such a witless imbecile managed to get on the show. <laughs> then he introduces the contestants. <laughs> Our version of the contest is slightly different from the original in that there are no multiple choice questions, and this quiz is all about hats. So, teams, let's play Who Wants to Be a Milliner? Okay, Tim, the first question goes to you. Who is the odd one out? Winston Churchill, Fred Astaire, Henry Ford, and Abraham Lincoln? Oh, um... Winston Churchill, I don't think so, maybe, maybe. Um, Fred Astaire, it's possible. Abraham Lincoln, Mm, Henry Ford, I don't think it's Henry Ford. I I think I've got it. Um, 
The odd one out is Winston Churchill, because all the others gave their names to uh, modes of transport. There was the Ford Cortina, the Lincoln Continental, and the Fred Astaire lift. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, Tim. The answer is Henry Ford. His hat size was six and seven eighths, <laughs> and the others were all seven and one eighth. <laughs> and I have to tell you that these are all true. I don't believe this. Six and seven eighths. That's tiny. That's a schoolboy size, I'm told. <laughs> your, your turn, Barry. Your turn, Barry. It's time for your question. What was the name of James Bond's notorious adversary who could destroy his enemies with his hat? Chuck Berry. <laughs> Is that your final answer? You sure you don't want to think again? It's only easy if you know the answer. I think he got that from Confucius. Are you sure, Barry? <clears throat> yes, my final answer. Final answer? My final answer. Barry? It's the wrong answer. Oh. Oh. The answer is odd job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you now, Ross. Here's your question. <laughs> Complete the following limerick. There was an old person of Fratton who went to church with his hat on. With a helmet from the Germans, he listened to sermons. It's a good job the spike wasn't sat on. It's actually, if I wake up, he said, with my hat on my head, I shall know it hasn't been sat on. Which is roughly what you said. <laughs> Finally, Graham. Yeah. I love those words. <laughs> Finally, Graham, here's a question for you. <laughs> What's a good thing to wear on your head to protect you from radio waves and mind control? Yuri Geller. <laughs> the answer is a tinfoil hat. Oh, and here's one last question for anyone to have a go at. Complete the following rhyme. If the hat is missing, I've gone fishing. If the hat can't be seen, I've drowned. <laughs> the answer is, I'm on the green. Yes. Our next game takes us back to a golden era of letter writing. In this game, each team will take turns to compose a letter, adding one word each at a time. The opposing team will then construct the reply. Tim and Ross will start by composing a letter from Burke to Hare. And then Barry and Graham will come up with a reply. When I honk my horn, it's the end of the correspondence. Okay, off you go, Tim and Ross. Dear Hare, I would like to offer you some time when we are alone. <laughs> and we are up in the <coughs> attic <laughs> with a chest and a leg. <laughs> of lamb. <laughs> which I find very tasty indeed. Sometimes I like to go to the graveyard and <laughs> with a shovel dig a body out of the grave <laughs> which means that you will have to cook some <laughs> legs and some arms and and some feet and some eyes and some heads and some hair and some little pieces of knees <laughs> which are best served cold <laughs> yours are
the coldest knees I have ever seen. <laughs> All good people <laughs> wish you good day and <laughs> love from Burke. Well, I don't know what came out of the grave, but I know who dug themselves into it. <laughs> Okay, reply. Dear Burke, I received this letter this morning, which I will tell you I was utterly disgusted with your sincerely <laughs> It's not worth the stamp. Uh, with your sincerely <laughs> felt lack of principle considering the time that we have been together in this enterprise. Nevertheless, I would like to point out that we must repeat must <laughs> on no condition reveal to any people other than ourselves. Therefore, <laughs> yours is colder <laughs> than mine. <laughs> but nevertheless, I keep thinking of you fondly every time I open the fridge. <laughs> wherein hangs <laughs> Tail and antlers, <laughs> hooves and fetlocks, which I rather think you should come round and examine yourself. Much love, hair. <laughs> Well, I notice it's very nearly the end of the show, but there's just time to squeeze in... Yeah, there's time to squeeze in a round of Scottish Film Club. S Samantha has to nip off now. She's off for a spot of salmon fishing with her new Scottish gentleman friend. She says she hasn't fished for a while, but she was tempted when she saw his flies and <laughs> would like to keep her hand in. So, so, teams, while she's away enjoying that, I'd like you please to suggest titles of movies guaranteed to delight an audience of Scots. You can start this one, Ross. Sporans of Arabia. <laughs> Tim? Scone with the wind. <laughs> Barry? Dundee, bloody Dundee. <laughs> William Wallace and Gromit <laughs> in the wrong trues. <laughs> Dumbarton and Dumbartner. <laughs> Sex och eyes and videotape. <laughs> Grampian, the Wonder Horse. <laughs> Coach Bill. <laughs> Meet the Fockabers. Bonnie Prince Charlie in the Shortbread Factory. <laughs> Doctor New. <laughs> Bring me the shortbread of Alfredo Garcia. <laughs> The unbearable Loch Ness of being. <laughs> Natural born cuddlers. <laughs> Fear in Midlothian in Las Vegas. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, as the lone piper of time appears at the gates of dawn, and dawn throws open the window and tells him where to stick his bagpipes. <laughs> I notice it's the end of the show. So from the team, Samantha, myself, and the good folk here at the Edinburgh Festival, it's goodbye.
Barry Pryor, Graham Garden, Tim Brooke Taylor and Ross Noble were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Middleton, with Colin Sell setting some of them to music. The programme consultant was Ian Pattinson, and the producer was John Naismith. Thank <laughs> you.